Welcome everyone to this Farm Advisory Service webinar. My name is Seamus Murphy and I'm joined by my colleagues Robert Ramsey, Davy McCracken and Stevie Thompson. And in the background we have Ian Boyd if there's any technical difficulties. This webinar is the second of a series of five webinars looking at the impact that COP26, climate change, carbon, that agenda has and will continue to have on agriculture going forward. In this episode, or in this series, this episode of the series, we're looking at policy and how climate change and carbon, COP26, is going to influence agricultural policy in Scotland going forward. And two great speakers for that tonight. So before we get going, I just want to ensure that everyone knows and understands how the questions and chat work. That's that's it's your opportunity to get the questions in for uh, our two experts this evening. I think that's where a lot of the value is in these kind of things. We'll have plenty of time at the end for questions. So make sure that if you have any questions, if you have any comments, get them in, get them into the, the Q&A preferably, um, or you can fire them into the chat. So just to give a brief introduction of tonight's speakers, we've got Stephen Thompson, who is an agricultural economist with SRUC. He's got over 30 years experience in policy with his finger on the pulse of what's happening with uh, agricultural policy in Scotland for the last 30 years. And Stevie is gonna be talking about what recent developments have been coming in light of COP26 and the net zero targets that we, that we are facing. After, da after Stevie, we've got Davy McCracken, who is the head of SRUC's Hill and Mountain Research Centre at Kirkton and Octor Tyre. Davy also has over 30 years experience working at the coal base of integrated land management in the Uplands in Scotland. So we've got over a half a decade of experience here between the two, between the two lads. So make sure that if you have any questions, I'm sure they'll be able to answer them um, and, and get those in as soon as possible. So without any, anything further, I will hand over to Stephen Thompson to take it away. Thanks, Seamus. <clears throat> um, hopefully you can now see my screen. Can you confirm that, Seamus? Yep, all good. Perfect. Um, so tonight I'm just going to go through some of the recent changes in agricultural policy. Um, in terms of uh, COP26 and um, some of the, the changes that we might see uh, and are likely to see um, as we move forward in terms of policy. Uh, and I suppose the, the thing uh, in the context of tonight's talk is that climate and biodiversity um, are right up there uh, in terms of policy drivers now. So we now have a situation where um, we are very used to in our sector for uh, food production to be the main driver of agricultural policy. So if we think back to the 2014 ambition, ambition 2030, doubling food and drink output by 2030 from 15, 14, 15 billion, uh, agriculture's role in that was, was pretty clear. Move on five years and six years time and we've had breaks it. we've had a climate emergency declared we've had a biodiversity emergency declared and suddenly priorities uh, of the government alongside all the covid issues uh, the priorities are shifting and you can see here what uh, the snp uh, this is from their manifesto back in back in sort of springtime uh, increasingly progressing towards net zero uh, tackling biodiversity uh, and investing in nature-based solutions and they're talking about half a billion going into uh, helping tackle tackle the biodiversity crisis uh, there's also talk about a biodiversity strategy and there's now a commitment to that so we will likely have a, a new biodiversity strategy uh, within the next year uh, or certainly 14 15 months uh, where there may well be legally binding targets for Scotland on biodiversity um, there's also the the peatland restoration um, and I'll come back to the peatland restoration because I, I believe that's the 
the quickest win that we can have as land managers in terms of reducing our, our carbon footprint. Uh, and then there's also the, the, the desire to continue to increase woodland, woodland planting uh, up to 18,000 hectares per year uh, by 2025 and then continued monies thereafter. So that, that there's big commitments in terms of financial pots. Those commitments aren't per se for farming, uh, but they are for land management. And of course, getting, getting farmers behavioral change uh, is one of the things that the government are keen on. The context of all of this is the, the climate change um, scenarios that we're all hearing about, um, trying to maintain below 1.5 degrees um, is going to be vital. Um, and the bit that, of the jigsaw that I quite often think is missing, and this is my own personal opinion, is that we don't talk enough about population. Uh, and you can see the graph there in the top right is the, the, the population, the global population against global CO2 emissions. Uh, and they practically mirror each other. Uh, and uh, that, that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Uh, but we don't seem to be wanting to talk about that, that or there's not enough discussion about uh, population growth. And we're expected to reach 11 billion by the end of this century. Um, so, so that continued continued jump uh, and if we're wanting to maintain a uh, climate below one and a half degrees increase from the industrial times then we're going to have to do quite a lot of actions and the the government have um, in the 2020 uh, climate change up uh, plan update this document down the bottom these are the figures for each of the different main sectors of what they call the, the, the greenhouse class inventory. Um, and you can see there at the top, a uh, 24% uh, reduction uh, for, for agriculture sector. This thing called Lulu CF is land use, land use change in forestry. And that includes um, things like what do you do with your grassland if you plough it up and put it into arable, uh, or if you're uh, planting trees, or if you're restoring peatland. All of that's embedded within that inventory not the agriculture one. So it, this inventory approach is really confusing from a farmer's perspective. And within the government's new climate targets of 2019, there is a commitment that agriculture needs to be seen as a, as a or for farm businesses to be seen as an entity rather than lots of different sectors of the economy. The issue that, uh, that we have is that if all of these other sectors, the, these um, we graphs are just the, the sort of trajectories that each of the, the different sectors are on. And you can see that agriculture and Lula CF go from the, the very bottom line is if all sectors meet the targets, agriculture goes from 18% to 42% of Scottish emissions if all, all sectors meet their targets by 2032. That's actually changed because the methodology for Lulu CF has changed recently. So one of the questions we get often, or I've, I've often asked myself is where uh, the emissions are from. Andrew Moxie and myself have done quite a lot of work for the Scottish government in the last year. And this diagram here, and, and I'm happy to share all these slides through Seamus, um, this actually is a split down of exactly where all of the emissions from agriculture come from. So you can see in sea arable mobile machinery is about 7% of all Scottish Scottish um, agriculture emissions, but the main ones tend to be uh, enteric methane from the dairy sector, from the suckler beef is uh, enteric methane is a quarter of the whole thing, uh, sheep enteric methane 11.5%. And that then means that methane becomes the, the target because it's the biggest, the biggest contribution. Suckler beef herd is 41% of emissions overall. Um, the sheep sector, 15, dairy, 17, and uh, arable are out, around 30%. So when the government are starting to look at how do you reduce emissions, they automatically are drawn to the big emissions. And that is methane, uh, methane emissions uh, from, from livestock. The Lulu CF, and this graphic looks a bit strange, but it's cumulative. So on, on the right hand side here, we have, this is the, the land, use, land use change. We have forestry land remaining as forest land. Uh, it's, a, it's a net sequester, quite a significant sequester of, of carbon. Uh, harvested wood, um, where, where the carbon is, is stored in the wood and the wood is used in buildings or fences or whatever it is. And then over here, the, the orange ones are all net emitters. And across here at the, the end here, we've got grassland converted to cropland. So every time somebody ploughs, uh, and, and ploughs their land and, and reseeds or puts it into arable, then suddenly uh, all the carbon or carbon is released from the soil. And you can see the extent of that there. 
cropland, remaining cropland is the second biggest emitter according to the inventories. And the inventory methodology changed in a really dramatic way um, this year, in June, June this year. And the extent of the shift in the methodology is the same scale as all of agriculture's emissions. Hence the reason I think that getting land use uh, or getting peatland restoration sorted uh, as fast as we can offers agricultural and the land use sector uh, some breathing space to then uh, tackle some of the issues with regarding to farming practice. Regardless of whether we were in or, in or out of Europe, uh, agricultural policy would have been evolving. If we were still in Europe, we would have already had the cap reforms. They had to delay cap reforms because of Brexit. They are evolving at pace as well. And if you read the objectives of the Scottish government, uh, the UK government, the Welsh government, uh, the European Union, they're, they're all pretty much the same. Everybody is trying to tackle the same issues, biodiversity loss. Uh, food production and also climate change uh, and it's quite a challenge to do so and one of the things that the the, the EU, EU are doing now is that they're going to be introducing these kind of things called eco schemes and a minimum of 25 percent of the direct payments so your basic payment greening voluntary coupled support payments would have to go into eco, eco, eco schemes if we were in in Europe and the problem with these eco schemes are is that they're based on income foregone or additional costs. Uh, so there is no income support measures uh, within there. It's like being in an eco scheme, uh, but being in pillar one. Uh, and in Ireland, there's there's been some real concern that uh, that, that those measures wouldn't be we would wouldn't be taken up, and that money would go back to to Europe. The Scottish Government uh, want to maintain ali alignment with Europe, so they've passed a piece of legislation which allows them to do so. So it uh, sits out with the UK sort of stance on a lot of this. Uh, and that's going to be vital for us to actually uh, going forward is actually we're not only going to have to work, watch what's going on in the rest of the United Kingdom, we're also going to have to watch what's going on in Europe and actually look at what their measures are, because that's the, the Scottish Government's current objective. England are moving uh, ahead with, with, with agricultural policy reform at a, an incredible pace, it has to be said. The, the bottom right hand graph here or diagram table at the bottom shows what the, the basic payment changes are. Uh, this is to 2024. By 2027, there will be zero basic payment and greening. Uh, they're already in this transition. So if you're in a, a, a situation that you're, you're, you're your, your BPS, your greening and your, your coupled support is over 150,000. 50, if you were in England, you would already have seen a 25% reduction in that. Uh, by 2024, you would have seen a 70% reduction in that. Um, so this, this is a dramatic phasing uh, that, that DEF are going. Now that's not to say that they're not introducing new measures, they're introducing their sustainable farming incentive. They're reducing, introducing this thing called environmental land management schemes, uh, where farmers will be given support for, for public goods, public goods, uh, including technical efficiency, but more, more focused on uh, things like soil management, uh, biodiversity management, etc., where there are there will be tiers of payments. And those tiers of payments, uh, there's a set of rules, what you must achieve in order to reach the first tier, to reach the second tier, to reach the third tier. And they're over multiple different things. So it's a complex matrix that English farmers are going to have to start evolve, uh, getting used to. That's all going on, uh, as I say, at an incredible pace. And Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland aren't uh, evolving at an incredible pace. And it, it, it kind of leaves me with some concern because uh, we still haven't got a common framework on agricultural support. So uh, at EU level, the EU set the objectives as to what all our policies were, uh, and we filtered down from that. We took all our objectives from that and fit into that. We haven't made that agreement as to what, what we're allowed to do with regards to agricultural policy within Scotland, even though it's a devolved matter in Wales, it's a devolved matter. Uh, and until we agree what that framework is, then we, we still are in a bit of a, a position where we might eventually end up going a deficit-centric approach. The Internal Market Act, the Subsidy Control Bill, both are about making sure there aren't barriers to competition within the UK. Uh, and again, these are another hurdle that we might have to overcome. 
So I've heard farmers, I've heard politicians, I've heard peers talking about uh, that Scotland will have a competitive advantage in the future because English farmers are not getting basic payment, they're not getting coupled support payments if they're in the beef or sheep sector, uh, and that they are then going to be at a competitive disadvantage. That will eventually be, be tested in court, I would imagine, um, and that will then be another policy shakeup. So it's really, really um, challenging just now to actually see what the, the rules of engagement with regards to policy currently are. In Wales, things were moving pretty quickly and very similarly to DEFRA, i.e. payment for public uh, goods. But they've taken their, they've actually slowed down a bit because they're, uh, and I'm working on a project with the Welsh Government, uh, and they're actually really starting to consider what the long-term implications of that change might be in terms of food production, in terms of their communities, in terms of their Welsh language, uh, etc. But the Welsh Government, it has to be said, do act <laughs> very uh, rapidly when they want to. And uh, this year, they, they, they basically announced that the whole of Wales is becoming an NVZ, uh, and that has been implemented uh, back in April the 1st. Uh, there's currently a consultation going on uh, after the fact to um, to see see if there should be any derogations, etc. So those kind of things are happening across Europe. Uh, whole countries going into NVZs, we're seeing it in the likes of uh, the Netherlands. Talking of which, that's why change is important, because Governments across the globe, not just within the United Kingdom, across the globe, within Europe, uh, are all coming under increasing pressure to actually make change on environment. Um, the, in the Netherlands, it's to do with ammonia, ammonia pollution, uh, and they are talking about reduction of livestock numbers by a, by a third uh, in the Netherlands. Germany are talking about livestock reduction. In, um, in the Republic of Ireland, they're talking about a cap on suckler cow numbers, not, not on dairy cow numbers, but on suckler cow numbers. DIRA in Northern Ireland are talking about that to reach their targets, they're going to have to see significant livestock reduction. And the, the key to this is both methane and nitrous oxide, because they're, they have high impact. So uh, we quite often talk about carbon dioxide equivalent, so a molecule of methane, 28 to 36 times uh, a carbon dioxide molecule, uh, whereas nitrous oxide is, uh, is nearly 300 times a carbon dioxide molecule. Now, methane has got a short life. Uh, it, it starts breaking down um, and that, that, that long life um, is no longer there. So it eventually breaks down to CO2. In COP, there is a thing called global, global warming potential of each gas. Uh, and this is one of the discussion points is moving from what we call GWP 100. So it's the global warming potential over 100 years to this thing called GWP star, which takes into account that methane is a short life gas and it's a flow gas. But that doesn't mean to say that methane won't be attacked. Uh, and methane will be one of the key first targets because if you can reduce methane, and how do you reduce methane either by breeding it, uh, getting uh, breeding cattle and sheep for, for low methane production, using methane inhibitors or reducing your herd. If you reduce methane, then you, you, you have a dramatic impact in terms of global warming straight away. Um, you'll all be aware that the, the farmer-led groups um, have all reported, there was five of them, Hill and Upland Crofter Group, the Beef, Suckler Beef Group, the Arable Group, the Dairy Group, and the, the, pig, uh, the pig Sector uh, Leader Group. Um, and also behind that, there was also farming for 1.5 uh, degrees, uh, where I also sat in that panel. There was also the Suckler Beef Programme Board taking forward some of the Suckler Beef Climate uh, Group's recommendations. And there was also the Farming and Food Production uh, Future Policy Group. All of these all of these groups have been trying to suggest ways forward uh, that the government could take. And then um, NFUS approached myself and Andrew Moxie to help uh, try and pull some of this together into what, what seemed coherent for the industry. Um, and we did come up with a, a framework here of, of support mechanisms where we, we keep what we've got. So there are two options. We scrap what we've got uh, and go the English way, which is new and everything will be challenging, or we evolve what we've got and do it better. Uh, and all of us in all of these groups, I think, 
thought that evolving it and doing it better would would be uh, would be better for our industry and would probably lead to better outcomes overall. So uh, by doing it better, we mean actually creating more conditions on farmers. Uh, and the model that we, if you ever read this document that we were suggesting is that uh, there would be two tiers for biodiversity, two tiers for, for um, climate change. And a farmer could then meet, he could be up at the top for both of them. And if you choose not to uh, deliver on either of these outcomes, then your payments, your support payments would be dramatically reduced in comparison with those that are uh, achieving or delivering. Um, the, the, I suppose the one of the most important documents now is the, the working together uh, to build a greening future, the SNP uh, and Greens Shared Policy Programme. The, the bit in the yellow is, is a long-term commitment by the SNP. It's been in all of their documentation for the last eight to 10 months, which is uh, moving half of, uh, of all funding for, for uh, farming and crofting from being, they say from being unconditional to conditional. I, I, I don't accept that because there's quite a lot of conditions with regards to cross compliance. There are, whilst greening, uh, there are greening conditions that people have to still comply with uh, in terms of ecological focus area. Um, and there's also uh, EECs, if you're in an EECs scheme or a forestry scheme, you've got conditions. So quite a lot of our support already has conditions. But um, I suppose from this perspective, they're talking about increasing the conditions with regards to biodiversity and low carbon uh, and becoming much more conditional in that sense. This Butte House Agreement is the, the, the Greens SNP document, um, and you can see straight away uh, aligning to the EU measures and policy developments is a, is a goal. Um, and then also, uh, for the first time, we're actually seeing now that the principles of regenerative agriculture uh, will be embedded within the agricultural support scheme. And the aim is that Scotland will be a, a global leader, leader in sustainable and regenerative agriculture. They have committed to new policy being put before a new bill being put before Parliament by 2023. So it's likely going to be at December 2023 um, that that will that will be going in, um, and that will be a new support framework that replaces the common agricultural policy, probably in 25, uh, 2025, 26, uh, that will be focused on climate, nature restoration, high quality food, business resilience, uh, technical efficiency and profitability, et cetera. And then there's a, a, another series of commitments on women in agriculture, tenant farmers, small farmer, uh, smallholders, organic farming, and making sure that there's a just transition on climate. In terms of progress, um, the programme for government that was released in uh, earlier, was it earlier last month, um, was the, they're, they're setting out a just transition plan for agriculture uh, and land uh, to talk about what the future um, support regime must look like or should look like. Uh, I do encourage everybody to have their say on this because if we don't have your say as a farmer, uh, then you're leaving your voice to uh, to, your, to your representative groups, that's fine. Uh, other lobby groups, so perhaps environmental lobby groups, will be putting in lots of submissions uh, from themselves. So uh, it's, it's, it's important that farmers' voices are heard and all that. They're, they're also going to consult in the bill uh, as to what it's going to look like, and they're saying they're going to do that in the next 12 months. There's already a consultation going on on the first steps, which is about the recommendations that come out of the farmer-led groups. If you haven't read it and, uh, and you think that you've got something to say about it, please, please do submit a, a response so that the government know that people are listening uh, and, and, and that your, you, your ideas uh, are coming forward. And then there's the Agricultural Reform Implementation Oversight Board. It just run, runs off the tongue. Um, and that's farmers. It's largely farmers, but some, some um, agency, as environmental agencies uh, in there as well, uh, looking at how, what the, making recommendations to Scottish government as to uh, what sustainable farming support should look like. And again, if you click on that link in the slide, uh, it'll take you to the website where you can see who's on it. What formal final policy mechanisms take place? I have no idea, really. I really don't know. Um, uh, we can make recommendations time after time uh, until such time that legislation comes forward. We have these debates in public. We have public 
engagement and full discussion of these things, then, then we don't know. Pre-2025, 100%, there will have to be pilot schemes. There will have to be a, a sustainable agricultural capital grant scheme, uh, I think, Mark, to why? Because we've got convergence view money and we've got agricultural transition monies to spend. So the government has got a pot of money in which it needs to spend, uh, else they may lose it. Um, and uh, governments don't like losing money like that. Um, going forward, as I said, engagement and policy discussions is going to be vital. Trying to get a handle on where where things are going without a, without a shadow of a doubt, there's going to be more uh, support or uh, your, your support will be targeted towards more biodiversity provisioning. Davey will talk about that likely in a minute and uh, more efficiency in your production. Uh, so soil, soil silage, slurry sampling, looking at life livestock technical efficiency, looking at nitrogen use efficiency, uh, adoption of greenhouse gas uh, mitigation technologies, whether that is breeding, fast breeding for uh, low methane cattle. So in your herd, you will have a proportion of your cattle will be low methane emitters, uh, but how you identify them, uh, you, need, you need sort of genomics uh, to help in that process. The, the, it, it, certainly in the dairy sector, uh, methane inhibitors should be able to be used relatively straightforward in the finishing sector or more intensive beef sectors. They should also be able to be used. And I've probably said more than enough just now, uh, and I will uh, take any questions afterwards, and I will currently just pass over to Davy. Thanks, Stevie. <clears throat> So thanks for the opportunity to speak to you tonight, folks. Can someone just confirm that you can see my screen OK? Yeah, can that's all good. Brilliant. Thank you, folks. So I just want to put a wee bit of detail to what uh, some of um, Stevie was mentioning of, in particular with regard to these multiple benefits. So you've probably all heard the term ecosystem services. That's just a fancy term for the type of outputs we get from various types of land management, but it's the outputs that, have a, that are a direct benefit to us as, as, as humans, and you see a number of them listed there. Um, we also talk about public goods, uh, and I've highlighted the public goods out of that same diagram. Public goods are those environmental benefits for which historically there's been no market, so you'll see maintaining good quality food production is an, is an ecosystem service, but it's not a public good. Um, because there's a there's, there's there's a market um, for those um, um, outputs, um, and we've also started to talk more recently about natural capital. Natural capital is just the type of land that produces those goods, that produces those service services, um, and what condition that it's actually in. Whether it's the farmland up the top there, whether it's woodland, peatlands, or or or, or our water systems, and I'll come back to those three down the bottom um, later on in the presentation. Um, so, and, you know, Shima said, 30 years of working in agricultural, agri-environment sort of policy, ecosystem services are not new, public goods are not new, natural capital is maybe a wee bit newer, um, so why all the fuss about all those things now? Well, um, Stevie mentioned, Stevie mentioned um, climate change, so these are warming stripes um, for Scotland from 1884 until um, the last few years, basically each column is the is, is a particular year, um, and um, red is where and the average temperature in that year was much greater than the long-term average. Um, the, the, the deeper the red, the, 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 the hotter the temperature was that year. Um, blue, uh, the deeper the blue, the cooler the, the temperature was that year. And you can see, hopefully, that in, at least in the last 20 odd years, we've really had, um, we are already in a period of sort of global, um, global warming, even here in Scotland. Um, and what we're looking to do is not stop global warming, we're looking to actually um, have halt it, stop it getting any worse than what it, than what it already is. Stevie has also mentioned we're also in a biodiversity crisis and the climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis are strongly interlinked. We've actually been in a biodiversity crisis for a lot longer than we've recognised um, in the climate emergency. We've been in a biodiversity crisis all through my career um, as more and more data has come to, come, come to the fore. We know that um, our butterflies are declining, our moths are declining, 
concerns about our bird populations, concerns about um, um, our um, bee and other pollinator um, populations. Um, here in Scotland, we only have a good data on biodiversity, um, bird biodiversity for um, since 1994, uh, and we use, uh, or Nature Scott and Scottish Government use an index, they group species into um, woodland birds, farmland birds, upland birds. Um, and basically they took, uh, they, they take the size of the population that those groups were um, in 1994 as the starting point and call it um, 100. And then every year um, after that, um, they've been, um, seeing, assessing how well or otherwise those bird species um, have been doing. So the group of bird species that fall under woodlands have generally increased since 1994. Uh, the group of bird species that all fall under farmland have generally bobbled along much, much of the muchness um, since 1994. And our upland bird species, the, gr the group of 17 species that make, those, make up those, um, have, have been in decline since 1994. But these indices, they mask a lot of um, individual variation. So at the level of um, the farmland birds, common bird like kestrel, which was uh, when I was a lad, you, you saw them all over the country and all over the road sites. In Scotland, they've decreased by 60 odd percent since 1994. Latwing, oyster catcher have also declined. And our upland bird species, bird species like curlew, have uh, declined by nearly 60%, black grouse by um, between 50 and 60%. So there's a whole host of um, um, declines out there showing us that something's not something is not right in the in the um, Scottish countryside um, from a biodiversity perspective as well as a climate change perspective. Uh, these are the stripes here again. Uh, we have a Helmet Research Centre. A lot of what we're doing up there is looking at how you can make changes to the agricultural practices, like what Stevie was talking about earlier on. But if you look at the scale of change that we actually need to achieve between now and 2045. That will make a difference, but it won't get us to the level that we actually need. It won't allow us to be net zero by any manner of means, unless we also do this additional biodiversity management, flood mitigation, peatland restoration, woodland creation. It's only through doing those nature-based solutions are we going to actually get um, and the carbon sequester, the greenhouse gases um, and reduced uh, going up into the atmosphere and then have a benefit um, for Scottish society going forward. And I've put that little thing just appearing there is in my discussions with farmers and land managers over the last few years, I get the impression that many think, well, actually, we'll do all this biodiversity stuff um, or woodland creation stuff, and that's only going to benefit Scottish society. Um, it's not going to benefit me as a farmer or a crofter. Well, farmers and crofters are not immune to climate change. Making many of these sort of changes, if not all of these changes um, on individual farms and crofts, will also improve the resilience of those farms and crofts to future climatic shocks um, going forward. So what does that mean for different farming systems? Um, well, Stevie's already mentioned soil, soil nutrient management is, is going to be every farm is going to have to do uh, something um, about that. And also about how you then manage the subsequent sword on top of that or the, or the crops on top of that to actually make sure, maintain healthy soils um, and ensure that they're not um, um, emitting uh, unnecessarily by putting on too much fertilizer, overgrazing them, et cetera, et cetera. So every farmer will have to do something from a soil perspective. Those farmers or land managers that have peatlands um, in their, in their, on their ground as well, then the map on the left there is our extent of peatlands in Scotland. We've got an awful lot of it. 2 million hectares of it, um, but an awful lot of it, over 70%, is currently degraded in some sort of shape or form. So Stevie has already said, doing peatland restoration, capping those emissions, making those peatlands much more of a functioning wetland again, will have a big win. It's a big challenge, but it's going to be a big win um, going forward. This is the map of woodland distribution in Scotland. We're currently at about 18%. Um, the green on the map is uh, plantation forestry. The purple you can see in the map is native, native deciduous woodland. And nevertheless, uh, uh, we've got a, a big aspiration to increase um, woodland uh, cover um, in, in Scotland uh, rapidly over, over the coming sort of 10, 15, 15 years. Um, and again, Everybody has a role, every farmer, every land manager will have a role in actually creating more trees and woodland on their farm. The point is to actually be more creative. It's not always a case of replacing far farming been replaced by, by woodlands and forests. We can actually integrate trees and woodland more effectively on existing farms, um, but still actually maintain the, um, the, the farming practices. As I say, it's just a case of thinking out of the box. 
Um, water is another big issue in Scotland. Um, the map on the right here is all the water courses in Scotland. The blues and the greens um, highlight where there's good water quality. The yellows and the oranges and the red highlight where there's poor water quality. As far as water quality is concerned, there's very much an upland lowland split here. It will be down to our lowland and farming systems and land managers to do more for water quality and um, going forward and um, to actually address the, the issues that are that are being produced in many of these lowland areas. However, water quantity is also a major issue um, in Scotland um, and actually doing something to actually reduce and mitigate flood events down in the lowlands um, after extreme um, rainfall events is going to be a big focus for upland land managers um, in the future. I would say managing water quantity is going to be as much of a focus for, for um, upland land managers as managing food production, as managing um, bi uh, biodiversity. As far as biodiversity is concerned, this is where it gets a, a bit more, oops, pardon me, excuse me. That's where it gets a bit more, more, more difficult. It's not as generic. Um, and, and down in our um, lowlands, uh, the big focus on biodiversity will be managing what remnant of habitats still exist uh, in those lowland land, landscapes, but also putting more um, of the habitats that we've actually lost over the last 40 years back into those landscapes in order to ensure um, the wildlife that lives there have the necessary um, habitats and, and food and um, living opportunities that, that, that they actually need. Up in our uplands, um, it's actually more about maintaining um, appropriate grazing levels and in many cases putting re-establishing um, grazing levels because much of the biodiversity that we put a, a, a big niche conservation focus on in our upland areas is um, associated with um, um, habitats that need some form of grazing management um, on them. I'll just finish by giving a few examples of what we're doing up at Kirkton Octotai and near Cree and Larrach. So the water courses down the lower part of the farm were fenced off the water margins um, and, just, and just, let them, um, just let them establish. So we didn't plant them, we just fenced them off. Um, and that floristic richness that you can see there has just come from actually reducing the grazing pressure in those part of the farms. Um, we get two and a half to three and a half metres um, of rain um, on the farm each year. Uh, up until six years ago, we didn't have any standing water on the farm. And um, we established these um, wader scrapes under a, an agri-environment and climate change scheme, primarily aimed at birds like um, lapwing and curlew, but we are not going to get them back um, without more landscape level action. But we've already seen a big increase in the in the invertebrate populations utilizing um, these um, pools that we now have on the farm that weren't there before. Excuse me. Um, we've done peatland restoration on the farm, going from left to right in your screens, and um, the open faces of, of bare peat, uh, what are called peat hags. Our contractors have reprofiled those. We've got some erosion gullies on the farm that we'll, the contractors have put in a range of dams to hold water back, allow the sphagnum to re-establish and hopefully then um, re-establish the, 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 the peat. And we also have a couple of areas on the farm where it's flat, but the peat is unvegetated and it's called a peat pan and we've been taking action to sort of re-wet those bare areas of peat to try and get them to, to re-establish again. We mentioned trees, we've put a big focus on integrating trees in different forms, whether it's in um, sh new shelter belts and whether it's along the, um, the water courses, um, our, our, our riparian zones, or whether it's where we, also, we already have mature trees in the fields but they're, they're, they're not able to actually um, have any succession because those fields are also grazed. So we put protected new trees in in order to allow some sort of succession for that coming through. So, it, and we've managed to do that um, across uh, the in by part of our farms, which are a key crucial part of the farms without having any major impact on the agricultural management. In fact, I would argue strongly that once these trees establish, they'll be very good, not only for shelter for livestock during the winter months, which is traditionally at Green Lark, where we've got a concern, but we've seen drought-like conditions over the last um, two or three years and shelter um, from the sun will become increasingly important um, in many um, areas of Scotland. We have planted in one of our big glens, we established over 200 hectares um, of new woodland 20 odd years ago. That um, um, has taken that area um, out of production um, at the minute um, and uh, I recognise there is a different scale um, of woodland, woodland creation that's actually out there. I also just wanted to actually mention, even when you have existing woodland, there's more that can be done with it. Um, the graphic on the right 
the pie charts are showing uh, the condition of the native woodland that occurs in each of these areas of Scotland. Don't need to go into detail. All you need to know is where the pie chart is orange, that's indicating the proportion of native woodland in one of those areas where the biodiversity is in unfavourable condition and some form of management of the woodland would improve that condition. In the vast majority of cases it's over half the woodlands, uh, at least half the woodlands or more would benefit um, from actually um, um, some more effective management, uh, both from a biodiversity perspective and from a woodland production perspective. So, um, as Stevie's highlighted, greater integration with other land uses is going to be the way forward. Um, all land managers need to um, change their attitudes, change their perceptions, see delivering public goods in the same light as delivering um, food products. Um, Steve has mentioned there'll be a need for a reward or regulation in order to recognise that public good delivery or encourage and facilitate that public good delivery. And we also um, need metrics going forward so as we can assess how much uh, an individual farm or crop is actually producing, so as we can actually continue to justify the rewards that are being um, provided to those farmers and crofters. When you get the slides, there's a number of links there to a variety of podcasts and videos. We always have to thank our funders. So thank you very much for that. I will stop sharing, hopefully. And we can get to the Q&A. That was brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Stephen and Davey. Um, I'm sure we have plenty of questions there just waiting to come in. Um, have we got many just now, Robert? Yep, we've got enough to make a start. Anyway, Seamus, always room for more. Plenty of good questions coming in. Um, my first question is to Stevie, who I hope is there. Yeah, yeah, I'm it's here. A, um, it's <laughs> picking up on, on so obviously COP, uh, COP26, um, GWP star, big change from GWP100. What impact do you think that, can you expand on that a wee bit? We touched on it, but what impact do you think that will have on livestock agriculture in Scotland, that move away from, you know, a different way of calculating it? So my understanding is that the, the International Panel on Climate Change have acknowledged that GWP star or methane from, um, from livestock need to be treated differently, but it's nigh on impossible for them now to and factor that into the, into the equation uh, in terms of the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement and all of the things that they were looking at um, will be stuck at GWP 100. So um, it's unlikely that they will adopt GWP star, even though they will acknowledge that uh, methane should be treated differently. Um, in other countries, um, so the likes of uh, Australia, I think it is, or New Zealand, they actually account for methane separately. Um, so they actually have a different accounting system, uh, but they still have to report uh, at an international level on what their emissions are. That said, as I said at the start, um, whether you've got, if you're steady, if it's static, then the, the methane, the, the livestock are contributing no more uh, to global warming than they already are. If you increase numbers, then it, it's an exponential increase. And if you decrease uh, livestock numbers, then it's a, a big decrease in, in, your, 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 in your, your early years in terms of global warming potential. So regardless of where we are, methane will be attacked by governments all over the world, whether it's through pipelines or whether it's through livestock. Uh, all that debate, um, you know, oil companies have, have got big pockets to try and put the blame cell elsewhere. Um, but uh, the, the industry industry needs to acknowledge, the industry will need to sort of waken up to this. That um, and, and again, that's maybe why um, methane has been, or certainly in, in Ireland, Republic of Ireland, the suckler herd is being attacked on that basis, is that um, a da dairy beef, for example, uh, a dairy calf hits the ground with very low emissions because the, the emissions are all tied up in the milk as the primary product. Um, so that calf is hitting the ground with very little of very little emissions attached from the cow. Um, and those are the kind of quandaries that people were going to have to have um, uh, and people are going to have to start, we're going to have to think about these, these things long term. But I don't think GWP star will be uh, adopted at, at COP26, even though I think they will officially maybe acknowledge it. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. And do you think, 
Again, just another good question come in there. Do you think it will alter the way that we are doing when we are carbon auditing? Do you think that the carbon auditing process will change? Um, so uh, myself and Andrew Moxie have been saying to government for quite some time that they need to, they should be running or we should be trying to run concurrently a GWP 100 carbon calculators and also a GWP star calculator so that then you know the upper and lower bounds of what the estimates might be. Uh, and if we actually have that GWP star embedded, it's not an easy calculation to embed though. Um, it's not quite as simple as a linear uh, increase in or a consistent increase in carb, uh, carbon dioxide as a result of methane. Um, but bedding that in is, is going to be vital. And, and the key for all of this is, uh, unless we know what a baseline for individuals are for Scotland is, for the UK is, how, how are we ever going to manage pro, man, or monitor or manage progress uh, towards lower emissions? So somehow getting a better handle on uh, individual farms, and that's part of what the, the strategic research programme, the next programme is going to be trying to look at is developing an integrated um, inventory for each farm, um, as well as uh, the sort of more private sector, which is the carbon footprinting. I think it will become part of your policy is that if you're not part, if you're not doing carbon footprinting, or it will become one of the conditions, this conditionality, carbon footprinting will be one of them. Yeah, and, and it's, this isn't a plug for business here either, but for me, we do, we do a lot of carbon audits and it's a great way of actually getting a look into a business and, and you know, start to unpick your business and where those inefficiencies are. So for those of people who are thinking about doing one, it's not a time to, to wait and see if it's going to be a funded one down the line or see if we'll be forced to do it or whatever. It's a well worthwhile exercise to, to go through at this stage as well and find out where we're at. Well, you, you and I know, Robert, from the work we did on the cattle tracing system, we did a, a a look-see and an analysis at a business level for farms, um, splitting out dairy and well, basically looking at systems. So we we aligned them to sort of dairy and then the QMS type of systems. Um, and it was quite quite astounding when you looked at some of the bigger herds, uh, the sort of the calves reared per 100 cows, the mortality levels in some herds. Uh, and, you know, there are, there we all, we all, look at other, everyone else and sort of think that we're doing brilliantly and and everything's good at home whereas actually making sure that your metrics are up there um, are vital and I, I had a conversation with a farmer a while ago and he said well I can't do any better so I'm as well getting out of beef and I'm going well, hold on a second what, why is that and he said because I can't make any improvement and all of the government policy is talking about improvement and efficiency and I think it's absolutely vital that people understand that actually delivery of outcomes is is what we should be looking at not improvement so once you get to 94 calves per reared per or finished or whatever it is per 100 cows you've you've made the improvement you're at the top tier uh, and you know you should be rewarded accordingly same with people with biodiversity uh, that are provisioning on biodiversity because you've already undergone that transition and you've done it that doesn't mean say you shouldn't be rewarded uh, it, it actually means you should be rewarded and you'll be rewarded faster and the, the beauty on those efficiency gains as well, Stevie, are you know you get rewarded at the market as well. You get you've certainly in that calf reared percentage, you've got more calves to sell, and your overall uh, methane per kilo of output is, is better. But we could discuss that one all night. Um, what's been mentioned there a lot is outcomes, Stevie. This one's for you. We can do obviously we can do carbon audits. We can see where we are in it for a, from a methane perspective. What about biodiversity? If things are going to be outcome based, how do we how do we monitor that and how, how will that be measured going forward? Um, well, as I said in the presentation, there's going to be, there, there will be a, there'll be different expectations for different farming systems because, uh, you know, the current um, uh, biodiversity outcomes or biodiversity deliver will differ, whether you're in the uplands or the lowlands, whether in, in whatever farming system you're actually in. Um, and biodiversity, just yet yeah, another fancy word, it means all living things. So if we wanted to try and measure biodiversity on a farm, we have to be actually clear what it is we're expecting that farm to deliver. Is it habitat management, uh, condition of the habitat? Is it, um, is it for birds? Is it for butterflies? We can't just say to farmers, do more for biodiversity without actually being clearer what we actually want because um, it's then impossible, if we're not clear what we want, it's impossible for them to 
to deliver it. It's also impossible for us to actually measure it. For the vast majority um, of biodiversity metrics, um, they will probably um, revolve around surrogates. So I mentioned curlews have declined by six, nearly 60% in Scotland since 1994. I would like to see a lot more farmers and crofters doing more positive action for curlew and other, and other wading birds. But um, I, would not I would not want that the outcome that they are getting paid on or um, rewarded on solely to be going from zero curlew to five curlew or 10 curlew or whatever, because there's a whole host of other um, um, uh, factors that can actually dictate whether those curlew will actually appear in a certain time frame um, or not, that's out with the farmer's control. But you can actually um, plan, prepare, um, look at a farm and say, if you actually had this type of management in this part of the farm and this type of habitat in that part of the farm, and it was in this sort of condition or that sort of condition, it would be much more likely to actually have um, 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 curlew or lapwing or whatever you're, you're, you're targeting. So these outcome-based um, um, approaches um, are being trialled in Scotland, and there's five ongoing, at least ongoing at the moment. One's arable focused, one's um, wading bird focused. There's two out in the West Coast that are more sort of habitat focused. Um, and they're building on um, approaches that have been trialled and are now being implemented elsewhere in Europe, and particularly in the Republic of Ireland, who's really sort of leading on this. Um, and so we're, we're not going into this blind, but we're not going into this also expecting every farmer to have a very detailed audit of what's, what's on their farm or what could be on their farm. If that yeah, helps. Excellent. Thanks, Davey. Just hey, I see you have your hand up. You were behind the uh, question panel, so. I <laughs> uh, just behind that that um, question or Davy's response as well. It's one of the things that we've been really, really consistent with saying is that um, the government can't be prescriptive as to what biodiversity actions that individual farms have uh, have to adopt as part of increased conditions or uh, more cross compliance measures. Those should be a suite and a quite 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 a large suite, so they're uh, adaptable to location, system, and, and scale of scale of system, scale of, of farming enterprise or crofting enterprise. So it actually fits in with systems, and people have choices uh, rather than a prescriptive list saying thou must do A B C D. It's thou should do something from these, uh, and if you don't, then you will be on a, a, a reduced tier. Now that that's where we've got to as a group of individuals talking about it where the government go with it I, i'm not quite sure yet and just to emphasize robert because I, I saw it appearing in one of the questions you know in the farmer-led groups and um, they were all consistent um in um calling for a biodiversity audit you know i would argue very strongly that that biodiversity audit is not just to actually identify what's currently on the farm and croft and that's all you actually manage. As I mentioned in the presentation, for much of these biodiversity declines, there'll be um, farms and crops where that audit will actually also identify what else you can put back and where you could put it back potentially. Um, and that is an important that will be important going forward. Biodiversity, it's not it's not a tick box exercise. Oh, I haven't got very much of it, so I can't really do very much for it. Well, actually, I'll struggle, I struggle to think of any um, 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 farming. Um, situation in Scotland where you know a, a farm might not be able to do anything for it. Some farms might have to do more in terms of re-establishing, restoring habitats, but nevertheless, you know, there'll, there'll be something that every um, um, or, or some range of things that every every farm in Croft in Scotland could do something on, and, and that, that would improve the biodiversity, that would help justify the continued payments and um, payments to them. Yeah, excellent. What does that, I mean, does that head towards, where does rewilding sit, sit in all of this, Davey? Well, rewilding is just another word that, you know, is uh, thrown out an awful lot uh, or thrown about, but nobody actually defines what it is. So I've said, when I'm talking about biodiversity with farmers and land managers or anybody, I will actually define that I'm interested in farmland birds that need this type of habitat. Rewilding goes from anything from putting a few more trees, integrating a few more trees into our um, in river sides that we've done and burn sides that we've done at Kirkton Alter Dyer to actually taking out, like we've also done in one of our glens, a big swathe uh, of our hill grazings and planting that with montane woodland, you know, native woodland. Um, and you know, it goes even further in some people's minds and then also going to sort of reintroduce um, um, 
um, top level apex predators like um, like wolf back in, back into the countryside. You know, to some extent, you know, rewilding can be whatever anybody wants it to be. The, the key thing when you're talking to anybody about rewilding or anybody's discussing rewilding with somebody else is that both people actually be clear what it is they're talking about in the first instance, because otherwise the assumptions and the perceptions um, just do not help the conversation um, at all. Um, so I would argue a lot of what we've already done at Curtin Alter Tire with no, imp no impact on the agricultural system has been some form of rewilding. It's put things back into the landscape. And it's almost for me, it's where we should be, you know, we should be marketing ourselves a wee bit on that as, you know, farmers across the country are, are doing a lot of work and, and doing, you know, there's a lot of good steps being made. It's just we need to do it, do a lot more of that, that type of stuff and, and shout about it a wee bit too. Yeah, well, uh, you uh, probably people will see it more when they get a chance after the event to, to go back through Stevie and, and my slides. But those list of ecosystem services, those list of public goods that I flagged at the start, rewilding is not amongst them um, because everything that was on those would actually contribute towards rewilding in my view um, but also um, um, uh, the vast majority of farms and crofts in Scotland are already contributing something towards those ecosystem services and those public goods we're not asking anybody going forward to do something so markedly different you know um, it's just going to be um, in some cases it's, it's rewarding recognizing um, farmers and crofters for for continuing to deliver what they're already delivering as we just discussed others it will be for it will be for changing some aspects of the sort of the uh, the farmed landscape still maintaining um, agricultural production but changing some farm of the farm landscape so they produce more of what we're looking for but none of, none of what's been asked is completely alien or different to um, um farming as it currently is um and um, so you know and uh, yeah i will say it you know at this point in time the farming industry needs to recognize that there's an awful lot of opportunities coming over the hill for them as well as challenges there are challenges but there's opportunities and i'd much rather be a farmer than somebody work, working in the oil and gas industry at this point in time, because there's more opportunities for farmers and land managers to actually benefit going forward than there is for somebody in the oil and gas industry, other than just switching off the taps. And I, I think we can see that quite clearly when we see, you know, other industries probably targeting, you know, buying up land and, and planting trees and, and carbon credits and things. So. Stevie, can you mention a wee bit about, you know, the carbon credits are probably a wee bit off topic here, but as an industry, we've got big targets. We've got um, ambitious tree plant planting targets and, and very uh, ambitious emission reduction targets. What happens when we sell our carbon credits? You get money <laughs> uh, and you tie yourself into 60 or 70 years, perhaps, um, of whatever it is that you've chosen to do. So I was actually just typing a response to one of the questions uh, on growing soils. And I, I do agree that actually growing soils is the only way we can actually increase soil carbon in our, or in, in our soils, which are already carbon saturated. So um, there, there's a there's an underlying perception that we just keep on sequestering and uh, our soil carbon grows and that's not actually the case there's a saturation point um, and we need to acknowledge that now if you are going into woodland and uh, you take your forestry grant schemes that's fine that continues as ever but if you then go into the woodland code you're then tying yourself into an agreement where you are uh, every sort of five years, I think it's assessed. Uh, there's an assessment on how much carbon you've sequestered and the payments based on that. You've entered into a long term contract. Uh, if you've got wind blow, uh, you have to you, you will have to uh, plant that. Um, if you have a forest fire, you will have to replant it. You have to undertake the cost. A lot of the, I'm not 100 percent sure people have thought fully thought through the risks associated with the land managers. Uh, peatland restoration may be less of an issue, but if there's a fire, if there's wildfire and the peatland um, is, is burnt over, uh, then restoring that peatland again, will, the, the, the risk associated with that goes to the, the farmer uh, because these are long-term commitments that people, landowners are, are entering into. That will be the same if there's a market for ecosystem services. Uh, there's already a soil carbon code, a farmland soil carbon code being evolved. Um, and the risk that an individual 
individual farmer has is forget all what I've said about the risks of having to maintain it and actually undertake costs. If the marketplace, your who you're selling your product come to, so say I'm a dairy farmer and I've sold off a chunk of my carbon through or uh, through woodland uh, carbon code. If I then I'm in carbon neutral, I'm sitting here as a farmer. I've got all this blooming carbon growing in my trees. Why am I not being credited with that? That's because that's owned by some investor. You've sold those credits off to someone else. So suddenly, if Arla or Lactalis, whoever it is, comes along and says, "Let me see your carbon footprint." Oh, well, you're you're an emitter. You need to be doing more. Well, I can't do any more. I'm already got these blooming trees in the ground, and that's the biggest risk is the private market in terms of the retail sector, the processing sector, but then increasingly the banking sector are going to go down this route as well. So, the the banking sector have got huge targets with regards to uh, decarbonising lending and investment portfolios. So, I can see it in five years' time that the banking sector will be giving preferential rates, or uh, will be giving poorer rates to people that are, uh, aren't are on that carbon uh, trajectory. So if you're investing that's going to lower your carbon footprint, that would be fine. Uh, but if you're not, uh, if you're not on that, that trajectory, I can see the finance sector actually hitting you uh, or your, your lending becoming more expensive in the long run. Uh, so it's a, it's a big jigsaw. As I keep saying, there's lots of jigsaws out there. This is a big jigsaw that I don't think I, I, everybody's really thought, thought this through yet. And I was in a meeting this afternoon uh, and people from the peatland code and the forestry sector both said that they had never thought about the risks associated with the landowner. Yeah, and, and certainly you were talking, David was mentioned opportunities and put that really well, how many opportunities are out there for, for farmers and landowners at the moment, probably on the carbon credits thing, what sounds like a lot of money at the moment, fast forward five years, it might sound like a bit of a pittance as well. So, um, Well, it, it's also the, 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 the amount that it's, I, I've seen carbon, the, 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 internationally carbon's trading at a different price than what people are getting offered here just now carbon will suddenly potentially go through the roof if the big investors get into this currently there's restrictions on who can invest in scottish peatlands uh, it's meant to be kept within uk uh, they don't like international trading because then basically countries can buy up other other countries carbon uh, particularly on peatland uh, we've also got a thing called india f2 coming and we could have lots of foreign investment investors in Scottish peatlands uh, in the very near future. Um, so there's a lot of complexity in this just now that, I, again, I'm not 100% sure that people have thought it all through. Yeah. Um, David, you had your hand up there. Do you have anything to add? And no, all I was, I was just going to say, I mean, I agree with um, uh, Stevie about the risk. Um, particularly associated with signing up to any of these sort of um, 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 carbon schemes and stuff. All I wanted to say, though, was even with uh, current and historic woodland grant schemes, there was still a need to actually take out insurance to actually cover the cost of any um, any anything that would have um, interfered with that public funding um, for the establishment of those woodlands going forward. Yeah. Excellent. There are now so many questions coming in. We are over time, which is unfortunate. Some There's some really good questions here. The one, I suppose, just sticking on the woodland thing, um, Davey, you, you mentioned about upland bird species and, and a declining upland bird species. Is the planting of upland areas, is that a positive or a negative? It depends where, which urban, if which upland area it actually is. Um, and so, uh, there, there are rules and regs in place um, to seek to prevent woodland establishment on areas that are prime areas for wading birds like, um, like um, um, curlew. Um, uh, I head up a, 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 a initiative that's been going for the last three or four years called the Working for Waders Initiative. And, and through that initiative, um, um, members of the group and um, Scottish Forestry have been working quite closely on getting a better handle on where are our key areas for waders across Scotland and then getting that um, up front um, into um, application, well, even before an application is made, that the, 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 the landowner or the land manager, whoever's making the application, is aware that that's unlikely to get funded because it's, it's impacting on a, on a, on a, a, a key area for one of our wading birds. It's not just land management changes that have 
decreased um, birds like curlew and lapwing um, over the last 30 odd years. It's also increased predation has had a has, a, has had an equal role in that. There's plenty of, even with the size of the declines we've seen, we've got plenty of lapwing and curlew still out there. It's just the decline is because they're not getting getting um, um, survival of their young to a breeding age. They're, they're, they're getting hoovered up um, in the early stages of their of their life cycle. And that's nothing to do with planting trees, that's to do with lack of predator control in most of their historic habitat. Excellent. So, final Robert, question. Can I, yes. Can I, I come in? Because I, I think I clicked the wrong button to Stevie McKenzie's question, which was on, um, I, I, I think I typed answer live, whatever that means. Um, but so I can, it, the question was realistically, how far are we away from being able to identify low methane emitting animals in commercial herds to improve genetics and what's the cost of identifying them? Um, so in New Zealand, there's an active program ongoing for this in both sheep and cattle, uh, and they're pretty close to getting this nailed. Uh, certainly, um, they, the, and we've got colleagues, Rainer Rowe in um, SRUC is looking at, at this just now, and uh, the ability to identify them, whether how to get it into the commercial herds, uh, would obviously be slightly more challenging. Because I did, I did actually ask how much does a methane gun cost, and can we actually just point it at cows to work out uh, are they methane emitters or not? Some seemingly no, um, but I think this, I think that's one of the biggest wins that we could have is to actually breed the methane out of out of the herd um, in the next whatever. 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and and that that's that's the vital part of this is actually better understanding how we do that. Yeah, and the, the other area where we're probably even closer to excitingly as well as the, the feed conversion efficiency end of things as well, that we can we can certainly select for those efficient animals and breed from them and, and the the two are very closely related as well. So, uh, if we yeah, can... a high a high methane cattle or sheep, high methane producing animals, absorb mm -hmm. consume lots of energy in order to produce that methane. Yeah, they're not making you any money anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, final question to you both. This one's from me, but the eyes and ears of the world will be on us in Scotland in, in a month's time. Um, what should we be shouting about? And where, you know, how do we get our voice as, as Scottish agriculture? How do we get that voice heard throughout the COP26 uh, proceedings or in the run up to as well? Either can go first. Well, I'll go first if you don't mind. Um, and it's starting to happen in some sectors by being positive, by being, but rec by recognizing that farmers are going to have a big role to play in delivering both climate change and there's a separate biodiversity conference of the parties starting uh, online um, in this month and it will finish in China um, in, in, in May. Uh, by actually recognising and, and shouting from the rooftops that farmers and crofters in Scotland are willing and able um, not only to talk about change, but to actually start implementing the changes that are actually needed. That's what we need to see going forward. And um, that's what the eyes of the world need to see, that our land managers are willing to actually step up to the mark um, and and engage. Thanks, Stevie. Any thoughts, Stevie? Uh, no, I mean, it's just the case that, uh, I mean, if you look at well, the picture in my background, um, Scotland has got a challenging environment to farm in uh, but we do have a, a tremendous natural assets and um, you know sustainable food production is is the be all and end all now how we trade off a, a, an individual farm level um, th those are questions that I haven't seen answers for um, it needs to be done at a regional national level uh, so that we do perhaps have emitting areas where you've got higher intensity livestock uh, or higher intensity production that is actually doing uh, creating food production and then you have areas which are more uh, sinks where they're actually sequestering carbon and until we actually until I think global leaders start understanding that uh, not, not, uh, national envelopes aren't perhaps helpful. Uh, certainly regional envelopes are even more challenging because then you're limiting how much offset you can do and then you're trying to shoehorn everything into a specific region. Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest wins that we could have or we should be able to have is understanding uh, the, the ability to, to, actually, to actually 
look look at the solutions uh, more holistically than we perhaps are, uh, and actually acknowledging that food production is one thing. I've, I've the agricultural inventory. I cannot get my head around how we can ever create food at net zero, uh, because naturally I think it's emissions. Uh, regardless of how we do this, um, we will be emitting um, and actually starting to acknowledge that food production will naturally emit and then we need to sequester elsewhere uh, and reduce our emissions elsewhere through new technologies. Uh, those are the kind of things that we need to be shouting about and pushing our politicians and pushing our UK politicians as well as our Scottish politicians. It's not just about uh, what the Scottish government can do, it's about what the UK government can do too. Excellent. Cool. No, that's been really useful. Hopefully, apologies to everybody who's asked a question. There's a pile of good questions there that um, normally we would have had um, a few less and maybe got through them all, but uh, so many good questions. And hopefully we've managed to expand on, on a lot of points there for people. Uh, certainly, I think um, Davy and Stevie have both done a good job of getting you know getting the points across and also showing what, what we are trying to do i suppose as a, a as a farm advisory service to try and get those good messages out there and um, spread the word and be positive and that i think that's a, a, if there was a take-home message from today it's it's that one is let's be positive and let's let's step up and and, and get on but yeah. uh, yes well, thank you both for your time that's all thanks very much for joining us and hope you have a good night